Aren't you thankful for our pastors? Man, I tell you what, like we have learned, they didn't, they didn't, they never taught us how to preach, ever. But they have taught us how to pray because they understand that if they can teach us how to pray, then the preaching will just come. They've never taught us how to grow the ministry, although the vision is wonderful. They've taught us how to have integrity. Isn't that something? I'm just, how many, how many pastors forget to take up offering? I don't know, but ours do. <laughs> like literally we've like gotten to Sunday mornings because we have Saturday nights too. And we've gotten to Sunday mornings and we're like, oh, we forgot to take an offering last night, you know? Or even how many times have we gone to the park or done an outdoor event and our pastors get up there and say, hey, we don't want your money, don't give anything. We're just gonna worship Jesus. Dude, I'm in a, in a world today that is so driven by the zeal for money, um, it's really rare to find pastors like ours. And it's, and it's way beyond all of this, but um, my wife and I were privileged to be able to do life pretty close with them and to see the integrity of their lives. We're just so blessed by them, aren't you? Yes. Amazing, amazing. So anyway, uh, thanks for coming, especially if you knew that I was preaching. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so anyways, um, what is tomorrow? It's Monday and it's Memorial Day. And that's a very, very special day for our nation. Because how many know we wouldn't even have a nation if it wasn't for what that day represents? Right. Memorial Day is the day that we remember all of those. I think it's over 1.3 million people who have given their lives in service to our country. Isn't that something? I, don't, I just think it's special that even this Wednesday, we're gathering at Veterans Memorial Park. And I, I can't think of, honestly, I have a hard time thinking of anybody more like Jesus than the people who have given their lives so that our nation can be free. I mean, think about it. What did Jesus do? He gave his life. He died for us so that we could experience freedom. And I look at these, these people, these men and women who gave their lives so that we could have freedom in our nation, whether or not we appreciate it, they still gave their lives, shed their blood for us to experience freedom. And I'm telling you, they, they remind me more of Jesus than myself in a lot of ways. Can somebody say amen? Yeah. Aren't you thankful? Yeah. Um, obviously, like Memorial Day is to remember those who have passed away. But I also just want to ask, if you are here this morning and you are a veteran or you are actively serving in our military, would you just stand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Man. Amazing. Amazing. Man, aren't you thankful? Man, so much to be thankful for. Uh, I'll tell you what, um, we should probably move on here. Um, you guys cool if we pray? All right, cool, let's pray. Would you, would you pray for me too, please? Because I need it, all right? Lord, we love you and we are thankful for you. Lord, we, you really are awesome. You really are awesome. There is none like you in all the world. Just by, the, just by your mouth alone, you spoke and the world was formed. You hung the stars in the sky. You commanded the ocean to stay in its place. You are wonderful. And you handcrafted us each one of us individually. And God, again, I just want to surrender my mouth to you this morning. I want to surrender my own heart. Everything that I am, I surrender to you. And I ask you to help us this morning. Say this. Say, Lord, help me this morning. Lord, help me this morning. I only get one life. I want to make it count. So help me this morning to become more like you so that I can represent you well to the world around me, in Jesus' name. Somebody say it. Amen, 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 amen. amen. So uh, tomorrow is Memorial Day. What is today? Does anybody know? It's Sunday. It's, it, that's true. What else is it? Does anybody know? The birthday of, is it the birthday of Wisconsin? Well, my goodness, didn't know that. Okay, I'm trying to get it. I think, I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, Pentecost Sunday. Is it not? The day of Pentecost, right? Does anybody know what the day of Pentecost is? Um, okay, it's in the book of Acts. Um, I, I'm gonna say this. I have been burning, my wife and I both, we, we pastor the young adults um, and the younger adults. 
and the older, younger adults. Um, but uh, we, we specifically pastor young adults, and we have just been burning to see a move of God in our nation, specifically in Rice Lake, because that's where God's planted us. How many of you are familiar with the Jesus People movement? Okay, what's fascinating to me, by the way, I was just, this week, I've been thinking back on that, and I've been thinking about how homes were filled with young people, so much so that oftentimes kids would come to the houses where the meetings were, and they had to sit outside and open windows. And they would just be worshiping God and worshiping God. And then at some points, people would stand up and just share their testimony. Jesus set me free of drug addiction. Jesus set me free from suicide. Jesus delivered me from homosexuality. And they would get up and they would just testify to the power of God. And young people would flock there. There was no special light show. There was no special speaker. It was just this love for God and this move of God that happened. And as I've been thinking about that, first of all, we, we burn for that, for our cell groups, our young adult cell groups, all the cell groups, but you know what I'm saying. We wanna see that, where people are coming to our cell groups and there's not even room in the house anymore. Where people actually have to sit outside and we gotta open up the windows, thank God it's summer. <sighs> we burn for that. And I believe we're gonna see it. And I'll tell you why, because the Jesus people movement was birthed at a time when culture was completely chaotic. The nation was incredibly divided. Do you remember the 60s? I don't. <laughs> I don't at all. Uh, but my history teacher did. And I, if I'm not mistaken, there was a lot that happened in the 60s. A lot. I don't remember when the ruling was, but there was a ruling in the Supreme Court to take prayer out of the public schools. 62, thank you. 62. Um, when was the Cuban Missile Crisis? Wasn't that 60, 61? Okay, so there was that, and then there was the, the removal of prayer from the schools. Um, I believe Martin Luther King was assassinated that year with the Civil Rights Movement. You remember that? How many know there was some cultural divide in the 60s? <laughs> JFK, I believe, was assassinated in the 60s. Okay. This is like a history exam. I'm kind of nervous as I'm going through these. <laughs> I hope I got this right. <laughs> in fact, uh, Time Magazine published an article, or published a magazine in 1966, and on the cover of it, it said, Is God Dead? That's what it said in 1966. So that, that was the 60s. I mean, talk about rough right? Do you think today our culture looks at all like the 60s? A civil rights movement? Division? War? Are you seeing what I'm saying? In 1972, 70 something, something, Time Magazine, this is fascinating. So it was in roughly 1968 that the Jesus People movement started. And it started in Costa Mesa, which is like a, it's a city about southwest of L.A. Compared to L.A., small town. Small town. But that's when the Jesus People movement started. And it started in a house. How many know the day of Pentecost happened in a house? Isn't that something? The Jesus People movement started in 1968, and then Time Magazine published a new article. Just in the 66, they published Is God Dead? But then I think it was in 72. Don't quote me on that. You can Google it. But in, in some time, they published an article, and it said the Jesus Revolution. And it was all about what God was doing in the nation. I believe with all of my heart that our culture is primed and ready for a revival, the likes of which we've never seen before. Because if we look back, even to, see, we're just talking about the Jesus people movement, but if we go back to when our Savior was born, how many know in that time period, there was an incredible cultural divide? There was incredible oppression amongst God's people, and it was a really tough time, and God saw it fit that that was a perfect time to send Jesus into the world, the Son of God, born a virgin, to set men and women free of their sin. And it came from a small town called Nazareth. There's something about these small towns. Isn't that something? How I many we're in a small town? Okay, check. 
How many know the culture needs Jesus now more than ever? We're dealing with division like we've never seen. Everything's being politicized. Everything. You, you just, you, you say one thing about something and it turns into a political conversation. Right? We, we need Jesus. We need Jesus. And here's what's fascinating. Can you, do you have your Bibles? Grab them really quick. Hold them up. Hold them up. Hold them up. Hold them up. Look at somebody. If they don't have their Bible, judge them with your eyes. <laughs> but we're in church. I'm kidding. Do not judge them. Do not judge them. I think, I think, doesn't the word say that the same measure you judge, you will be judged? Yeah, okay, so I repent in Jesus' name. I repent. Now hold up your Bible. Come on. Say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. It, is it is living and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword. Than any double -edged sword. I, know I know it's alive because the Word is God. Word is Jesus, God. Is the word. Jesus is the Word. So when I read the Word, read the, word. The, word the Word reads me. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Woo! Go with me, with me to Acts. I almost started speaking in tongues. The day of Pentecost is going to hit me. The book of Acts. Aren't you glad to be with church this morning? <clears throat> the book of Acts, chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 4. It says, and being assembled together with them, he, this is talking about Jesus now, so it's Jesus and he's with his 11 disciples, okay? He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise. Everybody say promise. promise. In the New King James, as you can see, the promise has a capital P, okay? That's worth noting. The promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> Jesus is like, hey, stay on the subject, guys. Come on, watch this. He said to them, it is not for you to know these times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority. How many know it's good to be aware of the seasons? But regardless of the season, we got a job to do. Touch somebody and say, that's true. Watch verse 8. But you shall receive tongues. Oh, wait, what? No, no, he said power, didn't he? He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And, everybody say and. and. How many know every single word in your Bible is important? There is not a stroke of the pen of Paul or Moses or anyone that, has no, that doesn't have any significance. It all has significance. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In the, how do I say this? I want to, I want to be careful. Um, in the charismatic world, by the way, we're a charismatic church in case you didn't notice. <laughs> um, how many know every denomination has something we can learn from? We can learn a lot from our Reformed brothers and sisters. We can. They preach a great gospel message. We can learn from the Catholic Church. They, they have reverence for the presence of God. And I think people can learn from the Charismatics. I think we've got faith like children. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And I feel bad for, for churches and denominations that don't believe that tongues is for today. Because we see on the day of Pentecost, what happened? They spoke in tongues. Now here's, the, how many know there's like a balance we have to find, right? There's an extreme on one side and there's extreme on the other. And I fear that sometimes in the charismatic world, and I can say this because I'm a part of it, that we can lean towards saying, if you're baptized in the spirit, you will speak in tongues. And we emphasize tongues. We spend a lot of emphasis on that. And we forget that the words of Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he didn't even mention tongues. We're going to go to Acts 2 and we're going to read through it. But I would just like to propose that the purpose of the baptism of the Spirit was a lot bigger than I think we think sometimes. Are you with me? Yes. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. If you were to continue reading Acts chapter 1, you would find how uh, Matthias was voted in, essentially, or casted lots in to... Um, replace Judas. 
And so here we are in Acts chapter 2, and it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, by the way, Pentecost, it was 50 days after the resurrection. So it had been 10 days since Jesus had ascended into heaven. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Who wants to see that? Yes, please. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, can we remove that from the uh, Scripture? No, no, we can't, no matter how much, even if it's uncomfortable, even if we're not really sure that we like it, it is in there. Amen? Verse 5, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And I'm not going to try to say these names. Are you seeing what I'm seeing right here? What is that? Parthians and Medes. Medes? Medes? Medes. Medes. Oh, all okay. right. And Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judah, and Cappadocia, macadamia nut cookie. Okay. <laughs> Pontius and Asia, Ferga. Oh my Lord, we're going to fast forward. We hear them speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said they are full of new wine. How many know that the tongues, the objective of the tongues was actually to open the hearts of the people that were around them? How many know the day of Pentecost was not even, it was for the church, but it was really for the world? Isn't that true? And it's interesting to me that when this day had come, Many were amazed, but some were mocking. Have you ever been mocked for your faith? Has anybody ever been amazed by your faith? We're going to get them both. We're going to get them both. Sometimes maybe some of us have experienced one over the other, but we're going to get them both. And I think what we need as a church is to get over the fear of man. We follow a Savior who is not just our Savior, He's our example, He is our template. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 says, anyone who claims to be in Christ must live as he lived. Is that a suggestion? No, it's a command. So does anybody in here claim to be in Christ? Raise your hand if you do. Even online, if you claim to be in Christ, raise your hand. Okay, we have been mandated by Scripture to live as Jesus lived. And if we look at the life of our Savior, he faced rejection, didn't he? He was mocked by his own peers, by the religious people. They mocked him. He was persecuted. He was abandoned. He was betrayed. He was murdered for his faith. And the Lord's been speaking to me. He's like, son, you probably shouldn't expect anything different. You know? Because honestly, dude, like I'll walk into Walmart and I'm afraid to talk to the cashier. And I just picture Jesus in his loving patience like, oh, son. Come on. Like, they don't have stones behind the cashier, you know. It's, it's going to be okay. Remember, Stephen? It's going to be fine, all right? But honestly, I think if we can just embrace the fact that, I think, I think the fear of man resides in a place that we're just afraid to be rejected or mocked. But if we can, what if, what if we just changed our mentality and we're like, you know what? Like, Jesus was super rejected. What if we just expected to be rejected? We don't try to be rejected. But what if we just expected that and then when it didn't happen, we're like, oh, praise God. I don't know, just a, just a thought, you know? Wouldn't that change the game a little bit? If when you're gonna go talk to somebody, you're like, man, they're definitely gonna reject me, but it's okay, I gotta share the love of Jesus with them. Are you with me? So here's what happened. Remember Peter? Remember when Jesus was arrested and he denied him three times? And he was just, I mean, that guy was soaked in shame. He left his best friend and his savior, abandoned him and denied him in front of man three times, even though he had a heads up. So he was dealing with all of this shame, but then luckily, thankfully, Jesus came and he found him fishing and he's like, hey, Peter, do you love me? Remember? You remember the story? And he forgave him and he restored Peter. He's like, hey, my calling on your life is still intact, okay? Let's get back on track and go. So here's this Peter, not too many days removed from that, 
And it says, but Peter, standing up with the 11, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. I think Peter was hilarious, by the way. He's like, really, y'all think we're drunk? It's 9 a.m., folks. It's 9 a.m. It's interesting he didn't say we're Christians. Why would we be drunk? He's like, it's 9 a.m. <laughs> like, that's, that, that's, his, that's his reason. <laughs> hey, like Paul said, you know, become all things to all men that you might win some. Amen? Okay. Don't get drunk. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Lord, just make everything that I say that's dumb, just like erase it from all of our minds. God, I pray that it'd be like men in black. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and he began to go through the scriptures confirming. So Peter stood up, and he had the boldness in a moment. Nobody told him to do this. But he had the boldness of God inside of him and now upon him to stand up in the midst of mocking, to speak forth the word of God and his experience with Jesus. And it says, see, we always, in, in the charismatic circle, again, I'm, I'm saying this as a part of it, we overemphasize the first part of chapter two, but we forget the rest of it. We forget about this verse over here. Watch this. Let's see here. In verse 38, then Peter said to them, he, he preached a great message. And this, his message was way better than the one you're hearing this morning, okay? And he said, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Verse 40, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. I mean, no, we need a true gospel message. Then those who gladly received his word, how many know there were some that gladly received it and there were some that didn't? When you preach the gospel in your job, some are not going to receive it, but that's not up to you. Don't wear, don't wear the burden of that. It's not our job to save anybody. It's our job to just introduce them to the Savior. That's our job. So then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. How many know that's a good day? That's a really good day. So in, if we're going to talk about the day of Pentecost, we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about tongues, we also need to talk about the bold proclamation of the gospel. We have to talk about the revelation of the word of God and how it testifies to Jesus. And we have to talk about a message that calls people to repentance. Is anybody hearing me this morning? And we've got to talk about how if there's tongues, but there's no radical salvation, I question whether or not we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. If I can talk in tongues to God, but I can't talk to a stranger about God. I don't know if that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hey, man, I, I'm a part of the club, okay? Like, this first started as a conviction in my own heart. If you have gone the last seven days and you have prayed in tongues to God, hallelujah. But if you, in the last seven days, if you have prayed in tongues to God, but you have not spoken a word to a stranger or to anybody in your life about the good news of Jesus, you need a refilling. You need a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost. I think this is a pretty good word. I don't know about you, but it feels good. Why do we talk about the first four verses and we neglect the 3,000 people that were born again? I fear that too many of us are sitting in the church asking God for anointing we're not willing to use. I fear that we are contending for healing in our own little club without going out and administering healing to those who are sick. Jesus said it's not the sick that need a doctor. It's not the healthy that need a doctor. It's the sick. Isn't that something? We have to have the boldness of the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel. Even, in, even if people are going to politicize what you say. Even if people are going to criticize you and mock you. God is my shield. 
The Lord is my buckler. In him I stand firm. Look at somebody and say, this is good, man. <laughs> I like what Reinhard Bonnke said. He said in his awesome German accent, he's like, the Lord will not anoint a couch potato. <laughs> he said, the Lord goes with goers, but he does not sit with sitters. <laughs> the accent helps it go down a little bit easier. I think about the people who, I'm about to get in trouble. Paul said in Romans 1.16, for I am unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for them that believe. Many of us want the power of God without the gospel. If you want to experience the power of God, preach the gospel. You're like, but I'm not a pastor. You don't need to be. You're a pastor to your job. You're a pastor to your friends. You are the pastor of your street. You're like, I don't have any neighbors. We'll reach the squirrels. <laughs> Jesus said, preach to all creation. <laughs> okay, listen. I've been thinking about these shooters, okay? I've been thinking about the shooters that were in, the shooter that was in uh, New York, really close to my grandma and my uncle, and my family. I've um, been thinking about the children that lost their lives in Texas. Have you been thinking about this? Can I just propose something? I'm going to. Imagine, take these shooters, okay? We got one shooter here and one shooter here. How many know Jesus died for both of them? And if I may add, whoever, think of the person that you disagree with the most in your life. Think of the person on your Facebook feed that just drives you up a wall, okay? Think of that person for a moment. You got them? Okay, if you can't think of anybody, it's probably you. You're probably the, <laughs> probably the person. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. You're like, I'm supposed to feel better after church. What's going on right now? <laughs> We're getting there. Jesus died for that person. Okay, so now look at, we got these two shooters. What if, take the date of the shooting for each of these men and subtract, go back in time 12 months. What if every single Christian that interacted with them in their lives for those 12 months would have just spoke up and shared the love of God with them? What if every single Christian that just had an interaction with them at a grocery store, at a gas pump, at a cash register, in the gym, at school, going for a walk, the mailman, what if, the, what if every single Christian would have just said, hey, Jesus loves you so much, man. He's got a plan for your life, and he's going to use you in ways that you can never even uh, think imaginable. And beyond ways that you can think, God will use you, my friend. He loves you. If you give your life to him, he'll transform you from the inside out. Do you want to do that? I'll pray with you right now. What if every Christian would have done that? For the 12, yeah, what, and what if it was just 50% of the Christians? Do you think these two situations could have been avoided? Listen, I'm not being political. I'm being a Christian. I don't know if this is too hard or something, but if we want to see radical change in our culture, we need to not be backseat drivers, sitting in the backseat expecting the government to do our job. Blaming culture, blaming billionaires and economists for not doing what we're supposed to do. Are you with me? We have to take ownership of our nation. And we've got to look in the mirror and say, okay, am I judging people for what they're doing in the world, even though they don't even know God? Meanwhile, I'm remaining silent. If so, I need to repent and I need to change and I need a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? If we want to see abortion end, the solution is not a governmental policy. The solution is the revelation of who we are in Christ. Because if a woman knows who she is in Jesus Christ, guess what? She's not going to put herself in a situation that compromises her identity in Christ. And if, we, and if, if men know who they are in Christ, then they're not going to rape people. And guess what? If, if, if these two people know who they are in Christ, 
and all of a sudden they get pregnant and they don't know what to do because they don't have any money and they don't have a plan. Instead of aborting, they'll know what Romans 8.28 says and they'll know that God is able to work all things together for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And even if we're facing an impossible situation and I don't know that it can actually change and I don't know how I'm gonna pay for my diapers, they'll know that God will come through for them. But the only way they know, how shall they know if there hasn't been a preacher? You are the preacher. The days of Billy Graham, I honor them and I appreciate them, but the days are changing, my friend. We are now at the moment of time where you are the Billy Graham to your neighborhood. You are. I am. We have to link arms and we have to go out even if we're not surrounded by one another, even if we're surrounded by people who believe differently than us, even if we're in an, a political environment where we feel isolated. No matter where we are, we are the revivalist that needs to be there. I'm not being political. I don't care about your political beliefs. I care about your faith. I care about your relationship with God. I care that you have been baptized in the Holy Ghost so that you can be an ambassador for Christ everywhere you go. I don't care what bills are passed, okay? I do care, and we need to vote appropriately, okay? I'm not saying that. The Lord told me last weekend, he said, don't you dare pray for something you're not willing to be the answer for. That's what he said. He told me that, so I'm like, ah, Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, because I'm like, God, I want revival. And he's like, what are you willing to do about it? Why haven't you shared your faith? Why are you silent when you go shopping? You're surrounded with people. Are you hearing me? You're like, but that's not my personality, dude. Like, I'm more of an introvert. Guess what? I am a raging introvert. Ask my wife. If I could have it my way, I would show up 10 minutes late to church. I'd sit in the back row with Clayton. Him and I would just be kicking it. All right? And then I would leave during the ending prayer. I'd be out of here. But how many know the baptism of the Holy Spirit can transcend your personality? And when that happens, you're like, gosh, I'm an introvert. I'm afraid to talk to anybody. Guess what? When God uses you and you just open your mouth in faith, all of a sudden you can experience what it's like to be used by God in a way you never thought imaginable because God's not limited to your personality or your fears. All he needs us to do is open our mouths. Remember Moses? He's like, oh God, I don't know. I think you got the wrong guy. You should ask Aaron, Aaron. You should ask Aaron, right? And the Lord's like, D bro, okay, okay, I'll send Aaron with you, but I'm sending you to go. And then when he went, he didn't, he didn't oftentimes know what to say. But when he opened his mouth, the Lord gave him the words. Isn't that something? I'm sorry. I know this might not be the most comfortable message you ever sat through, but I'm not... At this church, our pastors have modeled that they are not interested in the tickling of ears. They are interested in the, in the empowering of the saints so that the saints will fulfill the work of the ministry. Aren't you thankful? I'm so glad, man. Our pastors will preach stuff that just offends my brains out. But how many know we need that? We need that. Oh, man. This is good, right? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We don't know who we're talking to. You could be talking to somebody that is planning to shoot up a school. You don't know. I don't know. I was at, I was at Walmart. <laughs> I was at Walmart a lot. Uh, there was this one guy there that was working, and he had this, like, great personality. It was just super funny. He'd, like, walk up to me and just start telling jokes. He was always working in the self-checkout thing. And he'd come up, and he'd just tell me this, like, one-liner joke. And I'm like, that's, that's pretty funny. I'm going to tell Pastor Bob that one. <laughs> Dude, I, don't, I love Pastor Bob's sense of humor. He's hilarious. He's really, he's really funny. Um, anyways, um, so I'm in, I'm in Walmart doing my thing, and this guy, you know, he was saying something. And, and I looked at him, and I just shared. I don't remember what I said to him, but I was intentional with the gospel. I just told him about Jesus and how he loved him and how he has a plan for his life. And that was a very quick conversation, but how many know we don't have to like go through the theology of everything that we believe, you know? Like, too often the church is debating about theology while we're not winning a soul. <laughs> you know, we need to get over ourselves and we need to go share the love of Jesus with the world. So anyway, I'm talking to this guy. Come to find out it wasn't too long after I saw in the paper that he had committed suicide. And I was, I was torn up in my heart because I realized First of all, I, was, I mean, I was thankful that I had the opportunity to share the gospel with him. 
but I was thinking how many other people are there that I've, that I've neglected that need to hear the gospel. Do you know what I mean? You and I are the solution. The church is God's first choice to bring revival to the nation. Amen. It says down here, let's see. Let's read the end of chapter two. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wondrous, sorry, many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. How many of wonders and signs follow the preaching of the gospel? I'm afraid, again, that as the church, we've become so focused on signs and wonders in our little huddle without actually getting out into the field and playing the game and then letting God perform the signs and wonders as we move out in faith. Aren't you thankful that we don't, there, there are no side, there's no sideline Christianity. Like we all get to play. How many of you were in sports and you got benched because somebody was like favored over you and you're like, this is dumb. I should be out there. Come on, come on, come on. Okay. Okay. So all of you are either really athletic or you didn't play sports. That's okay. For me, I like, I've, I always hated riding the bench. Like I hated it. I'm like, put me in the game. I want to go, man. Just let me play. I just wanted to be out there. I didn't like sitting there watching, you know? Well, how many know for us, we get to be in the game. We don't have to sit back and watch. You don't have to watch our pastors preach and then assume that they're doing all the work. You don't have to look at all the cell leaders and just assume that it's their job to do. No, you get to play too. You are a starter in the kingdom. Do you think that the economy is surprising God? Do you think what's happening in the LGBTQ community is surprising to God? Do you think he's confused? Do you think he's unsure of what should happen in our political sphere? So why is it that you're alive right now? Why were you not born earlier? Why were you not born 100 years later? The Lord saw it fit that you and I would be breathing right now for such a time as this. So instead of being intimidated by what's going on around us, we need to change our perspective. And we need to say, wait a second, God has caused me to be alive right now. I must be dangerous. I must be a part of the answer. I must be a part of the solution. Are you hearing me? Man, my heart's just burning, dude. Just burning. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Can you imagine that? How many, how many know this is legit? This isn't like a fairy tale. This wasn't like a dream that happened, you know, this, this literally happened. So imagine all of us, we're all looking at each other and we're like, okay, oh, you have a need? All right, tell you what, we'll sell our car and we'll pay off your medical bill. Oh man, you don't have groceries? All right, tell you what, I'm gonna pick up some overtime while you're continuing to find that job because I know it's been hard for you and I got your groceries for the next two weeks. Too radical? I don't know. Sounds like the Bible. Ah, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. How many know we go from house to house? They're called their cell groups. We go from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. By the way, I believe that food was smoked pulled pork from Norman Kelly. <laughs> I, uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure. Verse 47, watch this. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. How many know that the baptism of the Holy Spirit doesn't just produce power? It produces power for a purpose, as Pastor Bob would say. It produces power for a purpose. And what is the purpose? Go back to Acts chapter 1 and look at verse 8. And you shall be witnesses to me. Some other translations say, you shall be my witnesses. Yeah. Can I just encourage you this morning? Look at me, look at me, look at me. It is not your job to prove that Jesus is the king. 
It's not your job to get somebody saved. It's not your job to stockpile a register of salvations under your belt. And thank God. What's your job? To just be a witness. It's like the Samaritan woman. Remember her? Did she go into, into I think it was called Sychar in Samaria. She went into Sychar and she's like, hey, everybody, I have a th theological disposition about the cross for you that's coming soon. Everybody gather around. I shall teach you all. That the man that I met at the well is indeed the Messiah. Did, he do, did she do that? No. What did she do? She just shared her story. That's all she did. She's like, hey, 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 Mark, guys, hey, come see the man that told me everything I ever did. You got to come check it out. Come on, come on, come on. Guys, hey, come see the man that told me everything that I ever did. You got to come check him out. I'm telling you, he's the Messiah. You're going to find out. Come on, let's go. That's you and that's me. That's our job. Remember the boy that was born blind and Jesus healed him and the Pharisees were just tripping? Sorry, they were, what's the, they were like, they were really confused. <laughs> you remember that? They're like, the, <laughs> we're in Rice Lake, I forgot. Felt like we were in Kansas City for a second. I talked about barbecue, I don't know what happened. The Pharisees brought him in, questioned him. Okay, what happened? Tell us what happened. How did he do it? How did he heal you? He's like, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. They're like, okay, get out of here. Okay, hey, wait, come back in, come back in. Tell us how, how did this happen? I told you, man, I don't really know. Get out of here. Bring his parents in. Where's his parents? They got, her, they got his parents involved. It's awesome. So they call the parents into the principal's office. They come in and then they're questioning the parents. You know, how did this happen? Are you sure this is your son? Was he actually born blind? And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but you should probably ask him because we don't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. We're going to help ourselves out. Thanks, bye. And then they're like, oh, this is strange. Call the kid in again. Bring the kid in. And the kid comes walking in again. And they're like, okay, so tell us what happened. He's like, how many times do you want me to tell you? And they're like, well, tell us what happened. Is he, is he the Messiah? And he's like, whether or not he's the Messiah, I don't know. What I do know is I was blind and now I see. There's been numerous times I've almost preached a message called, I don't know. Because I look at this guy and he was an evangelist. He was a revivalist. And guess what his message was? I don't know. I have no idea. Whether or not this man is a sinner, I don't think God listens to sinners. <laughs> That's what he said, remember? Oh man, they got so mad at him. But I love it. All he did was he shared what Jesus did. And it's funny. Do you remember when Jesus healed many people throughout the uh, New Testament? And he told them, hey, don't tell anybody. Remember? So he like healed the leper. Oh, Matt, I've just prayed for this mustache in Jesus' name. <laughs> Be healed, my brother. <laughs> How many know that looks good? Yeah. If I could grow a mustache like you guys, I would do it. I don't know what my wife would say. But, <laughs> but Jesus went and he prayed for people. They got healed. And then he told them sometimes, he said, hey, don't tell anybody, okay? Don't tell anybody. But what did they go do? They went and told everybody. Why is it that back then, Jesus, when he told people to not share the gospel, they couldn't help but share it. And then today he told us to go share it, but we can't help but not. That's a good point, right? Right? That's a good point. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. You were born for such a time as this. We quote the book of Esther and we quote that verse, but we don't remember the context in which it was written. And that's very important. See, Esther was elevated to a position, much like Joseph. By the way, if you didn't listen to Jake Bradway's message last night, oh my gosh. Oh, so good. he talked about the difference between being enslaved and surrendered and how there's similarities between them, but it's important that we live surrendered lives. Y'all, please go back, go on the podcast sometime this week, listen to that message. It's, it's awesome. And by the way, I'll say this too. My wife also preached last weekend and she talked about winning in the wilderness and holy smokes, I wanted to marry her again. It's like, I don't, it's like, whoo, girl, let me get your number, man. Yep. What was I just talking about before that? I don't remember. What was I saying before that? 
Oh, thank you. Okay, Esther. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you because you mentioned Joseph in your message last night and how he was elevated to second in command seemingly overnight, really. Well, it was the same with Esther. She was elevated to a very high authority just overnight. And Mordecai found out, everybody found out, that the king was going to murder all of the Jews. He was going to murder all of the Jews. And Mordecai gets a hold of Esther. I think it was, she was his niece, right? And, and uh, Mordecai said, hey, Esther, like, you have to say something. You're super close to the king. Like, you think you're there on accident? Like, you need to speak up. You need to speak up and talk to the king. And if I don't, if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, I don't remember the translation, but he even said, Esther, don't flatter yourself. He's like, if you're not willing to speak up, he'll raise up somebody else and they'll do your job. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss my moment. How many know we have all been given one little vapor? We've been given one vapor and we get to maximize it or we can minimize it. It's up to us. How many want to maximize it? You can, man. You were born for this. My friend, you were born to be alive right now. You're like, yeah, but I don't, I don't know. I just, why would God use me? That's, that's a perfect attitude. God can move on that. My friend, you were born for such a time as 2022. You were not born 100 years ago or 100 years from now. You were born at the very moment, the very, the very second that you were born, on the day you were born, in the hospital room that you were born, or the bathtub, I don't know how you roll, whatever. <laughs> you were born for such a time as this, to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ and to preach the gospel to all creation, to make disciples in every nation of the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, making Jesus famous everywhere you go in all that you do, honoring God with everything, whether you eat or drink. My friend, you are, you are, you're put in the game. You are a starter. What would happen in our community? By the way, let me just say this. Um, in 2019, Pew Research came out with a study and they said that 65% of Americans identified as a Christian. Now we can, you know, mess around saying, well, what does that actually mean? You know, what, you know, but how many know that's 214 million people? Okay, so if we have the majority in our nation, even if we didn't, we just so happen to have the majority, if every single one of us would just win one friend to Jesus in a year, that's amazing. Is the Lord willing to do that through you? Okay, are you willing to let him? I hope so. I hope so, because we need you. We need you. Wherever you cut down trees for a living, we need you. We really, really do. We need your voice. You deliver chips, we need you. You're in the store, you're in with people all the time, right? We need you. Whatever you do, you do like crazy manure systems and you like, I don't even know, you've explained it to me three times. <laughs> like you like take the gas from manure and you convert it to fuel, right? So was that a good, nice, nice. We need you. Whatever you do, wherever you go, we need you. Your neighbors need you. Pretty good, huh? Okay, sorry. I'm, if, this isn't like the, if this isn't the most uh, comfortable message you ever sat through, you know, I guess I kind of apologize and I kind of don't. I don't know. But uh, I just want to share the gospel with you really quick. Do you mind? We need to know the gospel. Can I get a piano, please? Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not as cool as Pastor Bob. <laughs> The Bible says, first of all, I think it's in Psalm 139, it says that we were all knitted together, formed in our mother's womb. That means that God handcrafted you. You were handcrafted in your mother's womb. It was more than science that was just happening. How many know God invented science? God handcrafted, see, he spoke the world into existence, but you, he decided to handcraft. Which do you think is more impressive to him? His handcrafted masterpiece or something he just spoke? I'm gonna go with the former. So we were all born, the Bible says that we were born into sin. Well, yes, we all sin, but we, were, we didn't even have a say in it. From the moment we were born, we were born into sin. And that sin is what separates us from God. 
We could go and we could cherry pick all the sins we want and define what sin is. Sin is simply missing the mark. What is the mark? It's Jesus, perfection. And the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible even says that there is no one righteous. No, not even one. I heard a kid on Instagram the other day. By the way, if you're, if you're an introvert and you're afraid of talking to people, you can utilize Instagram or Facebook to be an evangelist. You don't even have to leave your house, okay? But you can make a mighty impact with the kingdom just by the click of a button. Anyway, this kid was doing this Instagram thing. He's from the UK. He had a cool accent too. And he's like, we as Christians are not any better than you. He said, we are just better off than you. I'm like, yeah. He's like, if we are in the airplane and it's going to crash, Mickey Robinson, where are you? It's going to crash and I have a parachute and you don't. Is this a good accent? I think it's decent, right? Okay. And I have a parachute and you don't. It doesn't make me any better than you. I'm just better off than you. My friend, the parachute is Jesus Christ. <laughs> We have all sinned. We are, sin has been used to divide people. I think it needs to be used to unite people. <laughs> Guess what? If, you've, if you have just told one little white lie and I've committed all of my sins in the eyes of God, we're the same. We're both equally in need of a savior, which is why yet, while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. God said, you know what? I don't like this distance between us. I handcrafted you so that I could love you so I could lavish you with my love and my goodness. I just want a relationship with you, but the problem is sin is separating us. But God said, ah, I'm done with that. I'm sending Jesus. I'm gonna send my one and only son to come and to live the life you could never live, which was perfect, and to pay the price you could never pay, which was his perfect blood on the cross. And so that's what happened. Jesus came and he died on the cross for you and for me, taking the punishment of all of our sin upon himself. How many know the blood of Jesus is powerful? What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Isn't that awesome? Can you stand with me? So how do we receive this, this salvation? See, when Jesus died on the cross and he was buried in the tomb, he was dead for three days. And the, and the, the rock was about, it weighed roughly three tons, anywhere between one and three tons. That's heavy. I'm pretty sure that's like from two to 6,000 pounds, okay? If my math serves me correctly. Either way, it's more than I can move. I can barely move 200 pounds, okay? And that tomb was sealed with a Roman guard. A Roman guard was roughly 16 people. And the Roman guards, if any, if any Roman fell asleep while on guard, not only him would be burnt alive, but his whole guard would be burnt alive. That was the punishment. So you have, you have this three ton tomb or stone in front of this tomb, a Roman guard of 16 soldiers, all awake and alert, watching for any sort of mishap that could have happened. But how many know an angel came? He blasted the seal. He rolled the stone away by himself. And then he sat on it. I think that's awesome. He sits on it. The, the, it says that the soldiers became like dead men, full of fear. but he resurrected, giving us passageway into resurrection life. But it can only come through Jesus Christ. There is no other way to the Father, it is only him. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. We go to the world and we try drinking from all of these other wells, right? We try Netflix to try to find rest. We try to use hunting to try to find rest. We go on vacation to try to find rest and we get home and we need a vacation from our vacation. Why? Because there's only one that can give us what we truly long for, and it's Jesus. Sin is an empty well, and it can do nothing for you but keep you in a cycle of shame. But the blood of Jesus will cleanse you this morning, right here, right now, and even at home. Many of you, God has been calling you, and he's been drawing you, and you've been stubborn. You've been stubborn. But my friend, Jesus is calling you this morning to give your life to him, to die completely to yourself, to repent of your sin. And that just means to turn the other way and to start thinking differently, to set your mind upon him and to live a life that honors him. If you would close your eyes for just a moment, please. I'm talking to somebody here and I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand if you want 
to die to yourself completely, to stop living for the worldly desires and the satisfaction and the temptations of the flesh. I'm, I'm inviting you to give your life to Jesus. There's nothing better. There's no one better. I promise I've tried a lot of it and it all really stinks compared to him. I assure you. And you know it too, because you've been experiencing it. And I'm not asking you to say yes to my message. I'm not asking you to say no to my message. I'm asking you to say yes to Jesus or no to Jesus. The decision... The price has already been paid. I said the price has already been paid. The decision is yours. If you would just close your eyes for one moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And if you're wondering if you should or not, your pounding heart is your indication. And I'm talking to you whether you're here or whether you're at home. On the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand if you were willing to die to yourself this morning. And maybe, maybe you've just been drifting from God. Maybe you did this a long time ago, but you need another, you need another rededication to the Lord. Well, guess what? He's here right now and he's willing. So on the count of three, if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand between you and God. Ready? One, two, three. Go ahead and raise your hand all around this place. If you're like, man, I'm done living for myself. I'm ready to live for the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. I see your hands. I see your hands. Oh God, you're awesome. Oh God, you're awesome. Oh God, you're awesome. You can lower your hands. Would you just grab somebody's hand next to you? Oh God, I thank you for who you are. Lord, I, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, Lord, we believe in the gospel. And Lord, we are not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation for them that believe in this room and people's homes right now are filled with believers. So God, right now, we give you our life. Say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I can't live this life without you. I've tried long enough. I bring you all my sin. I bring you all my shame, and I lay it at your feet. My life is now yours. Every part of me. I am dying to myself so that I may live in you. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. And even right now, God, I just ask you to release the fresh baptism of your Holy Spirit upon your people. Lord, that we would not just be tongue talkers, but that we would be bold preachers. Oh, God, that we would stand up and we would shout the goodness of your holy name. Oh, God, we thank you. Oh, God, we thank you. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. Say, Jesus, I love you. <laughs> oh, in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. 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 Can I have the ministry team come forward really quickly, please, if you could just line up here? I want to tell you something before you leave. This is not a Sunday message. This is not a Sunday lifestyle. This is a Monday through Sunday lifestyle. 24-7, 365, every day of every week, even on holidays and even on weekends, is better than 7-Eleven. <laughs> All right? So if you raised your hand, I want to commission you. It is very important that you read your Bible every day. And it is very important that you spend time with Jesus every day. You're like, I don't know how to do that. Just like you would with your best friend. Quality time alone with him. And then for the rest of your day, allow him to be on your mind and allow him to speak to you and enjoy that. And then get plugged into a church and make sure you come back to meet our senior pastors because they're amazing. All right. And get baptized in water. Okay. Those are your hypersonic instructions there. You got it? All right, I'm just going to pray one more time. Put your hand on your heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for your people. Lord, I commission them in the name of Jesus to go into all of Rice Lake and into Barron County and into Eau Claire and Chippewa Falls and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to make disciples of every nation, to baptize these folks in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you that we will no longer be backseat Christians but we will be starters in the kingdom. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, 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 amen. God bless you all. Have a great rest of your week. Go get some pulled pork and support the youth if you would.